today to have a group of colleagues who have a lot of international experience for sort of a conversational um, exploration of doing research internationally. And a very warm thanks to Dr. Tony Clark, who's one of our uh, directors of the Center for the Study of Teacher Education, professor in Component Pedagogy, who's going to be taking us through the afternoon. So over to Tony. And Ludo champion for five years. Oh, and, in and I should say, too, this is part of our year of research and education, which is really designed to celebrate the research we're doing, put a spotlight on the great work of colleagues and students, and um, just continue that conversation. Okay, thank you, Beth. I'm responding to an invitation from Beth and uh, the group you're doing, what, the year of research, and, uh, uh, the year of research in education. in education. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and so I, I asked this esteemed panel of guests and international scholars if they would join us in this conversation. And I said if each of them could spend a few minutes just to talk about some of the key issues that they find in their work, because they've all done international work. So instead of going along, I, if it's okay if you don't mind introducing yourselves. I can't remember your names. Um, <laughs> that'd be lovely if you'd just do that and give a few points, and then we'll, we'll start the conversation that way. My name's David Anderson. I'm in the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy. Um, I do lots of international research in um, three different forums. Uh, uh, one is China, in the Chinese context, secondly Japan, and uh, thirdly the Kenyan context. Uh, I'll, I'll reserve my comments uh, about Africa and dealing with African partners to my esteemed colleagues who uh, definitely have much more experience than me. Uh, my experience in the Kenyan context has been largely with my partner Samson Nash and uh, a number of different shirt kind of projects that we've worked together on there. But I'll, I'll reserve my comments, uh, my general comments, to all three spheres, but my specific comments to working with partners in, um, in non-Western contexts, in particular in Asia. So I, I want to start by saying that, that doing international work can be immensely re rewarding. In fact, when I consider my suite of research studies that I've done in my academic career, I think the most rewarding ones have been those ones where, which I've engaged with my uh, colleagues in foreign countries. Uh, and I say that because um, <clears throat> I think working with foreign partners really challenges your conceptions about a lot of things in ways that working in your local context may not. Um, when you work in your local context, you're very familiar with the ground rules of social discourse, of co cultural discourse, of the education culture, <laughs> of the uh, political culture, uh, and, and of all the rules that go around human interactions. But when you start to work in contexts cultural contexts that are very different to your own, you start to get challenged again and again about a lot of different issues. Um, uh, most recently I was having a conversation with my research methods students in Education 500 about this, about the cultural assumptions that are embedded in our methods that we employ. And uh, I, I've been confronted again and again about uh, what we think to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, assumptionless approaches to our methods are actually heavily uh, laden with cultural values and assumptions, for example, how we interview people uh, and the assumptions about how we think they're going to respond. Um, the notion of being critical, not everybody uh, uh, accepts criticism or critical discourse as a virtue. Um, it's very culturally dependent. We do it in our culture. We think critical discourse is marvellous and we engage it in all the time, but there are cultures, many cultures that don't uh, consider this to be a virtue. So. Working with your, your foreign colleagues, academic colleagues in different parts of the world is immensely rewarding because it challenges you, number one. I want to say that, that uh, in finding partners to work with in the international sphere, I'd like to use the, the metaphor, the simile of human relationships, uh, human romantic relationships, because I, I think the parallels are very, very um, uh, rewar rewarding to think about, to unpack how we get together and how we connect. So with international partners that I, I've worked with, in my very early career, I made lots of mistakes, <laughs> which I learned from, uh, lots of assumptions that I made, which I learned from. Um, so for example, the assumption that the other is like you is something that you have to continually have in the back of the mind, because as I said <laughs> in my introductory comments, the other is often not like you. They're not like you in the way that they um, think necessarily, or the way in which they do so the, the procedures that we go through in executing and developing a research program or proposal um, are not necessarily universally um, agreed upon in other cultures. 
So I'll give a specific positive um, attribute and praise of my Chinese colleagues. So when I first started working in China, I, I was uh, confronted by the fact that nothing seemed to happen very much for a long time. And in my mind, I knew how much effort needed to be invested in the timeline to develop something, to put something in place. But my Chinese colleagues seemed to move very, very slowly until the 11th hour when everything exploded into action within a number of days or weeks and everything got done. Well, I was immensely confronted because I, in my thinking, they needed to be acting much more sooner than they were. But that was just my frame. Their frame was different. They, they knew very well that they had immense human resources at their disposal. Um, they work in a cultural frame that um, our, our, our conception of, of timing is not quite the same as theirs. But yet, somehow or other, the task was completed and completed very, very well. And so we need to be aware that you know, our time frames about how things are now, not necessarily universally um, accepted. The other thing that I'll just, just talk about too is, is that, um, like the human relationship metaphor, there's, there's lots of, when you're an attractive university like UBC, there's lots of people that do want to partner with you. And I, in my initial stages of my academic career, was flattered by the requests that were coming to me to, to want to work with me. So um, exploring, developing relationship, working together, potentially at a smaller stage before you get to the great big grand project that you're going to execute and work together is very, very important. Um, you can save yourself a lot of grief and heartache and disappointment, once again, like the human relationship metaphor. If you take it slowly in the relationship and develop that trust, that foundation, having very clear understandings as to what the foundations are for your relationship academically, and in a utilitarian sense later on. We look forward to the paper on international relations as romance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, so, uh, the next volunteer, Patsy. Sure, um, I'm Patsy Duff in the Department of Language and Literacy Education. And because um, some of us here work on English as an international language or multilingualism um, in international context, we do naturally have a lot of connections with people in other countries and my own involvement started um, beyond my own graduate studies and so on with uh, research in Hungary in the late 80s uh, and it continues um, on and off uh, to, to present and then in China from the late 80s also through to the present. Um, and, uh, and I think part of my interest in international um, collaboration came not only from the field I'm in, but also because I was at UCLA uh, as a PhD student, and UCLA had very long-standing connections with programs in Egypt, in, um, uh, later in Armenia, in China, and then Hungary. And so I got involved in the Hungary project through that, even though my prior interests had been in another part of the world, especially Asia Pacific. But the, the points I wanted to mention just briefly um, tie in very closely with some that David mentioned, and I'm sure will be shared across the, the panel, and that is um, uh, sort of the bigger frame for it with, here at UBC, we have a lot of discourse around um, institutional preference for partnering with major elite world-class universities in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, for instance, uh, with any of the major ones around the world, Cambridge, Oxford. Versus, and so part of the UBC brand and you know being with peer institutions versus um, the desire or need um, to build capacity in less well-resourced areas to kind of um, venture into new frontiers um, and uh, respond to initiatives that come from those um, areas that are much less uh, researched. So there's that kind of institutional imperative in a way and trying to negotiate that. The second issue is sort of logistics of doing international work when you're also fully on the ground here in your own department and in the field of education, especially K-12, but not only K-12, post-secondary as well. Most countries have a schedule that's somewhat like ours. There's, you know, winter vacation, there's summer vacation, but the best time to be in schools is kind of like here, October, February, May. That's to say, not at the very beginning of the term, not at the very end, and not during those break times. So the logistics of being there and here, um, and factoring in um, the time zones, distance, 
modes of transportation to get you to the place you want to be, especially if it's pretty remote. I'm sure Bonnie has, I've heard Bonnie's stories about being on, on buses out to very distant parts of Africa. Um, uh, other kinds of logistics, um, <coughs> firewalls, not being able to get onto Skype, or well, Skype maybe yes, but not um, Dropbox, not Connect, not other kinds of uh, um, sh file sharing sites. If you're working with research partners here while away, um, there are some um, challenges there. Other logistical things related to time and season, for example, going somewhere and it's the harvest season, so the kids are out picking grapes or um, doing things in the rice fields, or um, national holiday weeks in Hungary. This is the case where in October, in October in China also have these holidays, but where you're scheduled to go at this time, they say, oh no, it's, it says Tuesday, but it's actually Saturday. I mean, today, today is Saturday, even though it's Thursday. So they, they switch around dates because of the holidays. So they, they, they repurpose weekends as if they were weekdays. But you're, and they're, they're constantly talking about, no, today's actually Monday. But then next week is Saturday, you know, it's, and so just things based on the way they deal with holidays and try to get more days in a stretch and use the weekends for things like that. Uh, a couple, a couple, the relationship thing in the Chinese context, as people who've worked there um, know very well, people from China, the time needed, the trust, the, um, um, the drinking, um, <laughs> and also, the expectation, which is justified, that they're going to get something in return. But you just don't always know what those requests will be. Often for me, there have been requests from visiting scholars, requests for fast-tracked or backdoor graduate admissions, requests of a sort that I, I have to reject because they're just not um, appropriate. And that has and that's happened on many occasions, even with my key partners, deans and vice presidents of universities, who then said, by the way, my daughter would like to get into UBC. And, and then, you, and then you, but, but she doesn't meet our requirements, and, you know, it's, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of hard to um, navigate. And then many, you go to do the research, and instead you're scheduled to give a lecture, or two, or three, or five, or advise students, or um, do things you hadn't intended, but it's part of the reciprocity. It's like, okay. Next time we'll come, if it's not harvest season, we'll do this. If you go to China and say, I'd like to do a case study, they'll say, a case study with 1.3 billion people and we need better education, what's that going to do for us? Or, so it's this kind of uh, research paradigms, ideologies, priorities. And part of that is also the eth institutional ethics and how you negotiate that. The final thing, um, with pitfalls, there can be many. But as David said, um, many pleasures and possibilities too, but you just have to be in it for the long haul because uh, especially in the context where I've been um, just expecting to pop in and out, it, it's, it's, it's really um, not appropriate, not feasible, um, not very rewarding. Um, my name is Maureen Kendrick and I'm in the Department of Language and Literacy Education. Um, some of what I'm going to say will echo what David said and also what uh, Patsy said. My, uh, my international research has been primarily in the context of East Africa, but it's sort of grown more organically and at a grassroots level, so it's not kind of institution to institution, it's, it's built on um, relationships with, uh, with individuals. And so I first started um, working in East Africa, in Kenya, in 1993, um, as a, and I, s I spent time as a visiting student at, at uh, Moy University. And uh, the relationships that I built then with graduate students at the time have, uh, have been sustained over the last two decades. And uh, th these people have become uh, my research partners. And so that's, that's the context of, of Kenya, and I'll come back to that one. Um, the context of Uganda, uh, I started doing research in, in northern Uganda because I met someone at a kid's birthday party here in Vancouver um, who, who was a, a long time, he was a Canadian but had been living in Uganda for 40 years and was involved in a, in a women's literacy program. So in both of these situations, um, there was a lot of, uh, there, there was a reciprocity um, with the women's literacy program, they needed uh, research um, to to support their grant applications, and so 
I was a, a, a new researcher here at UBC and I needed a program of research, so these two <laughs> things uh, went, went very well together. Um, my, my colleague in, in Kenya was, uh, he did a master's degree and really wanted access to um, teaching positions uh, at the university level, but he couldn't do that because he had no publications, and this was kind of a vicious cycle for him. He couldn't get publications because he couldn't get involved in research. So um, I looked at, you know, sort of, I, I see this now as a different model, so capacity building as part of that reciprocity. And so, so my colleague um, became very interested in doing research. We published three papers together. He now has a job at a university because of those publications. And so that's, that's sort of one of the first things I wanted to talk about, that, you know, the, the, the reciprocity, capacity building, what, what that can look like. Um, but the research design as well that sort of, that sort of grows out of that um, set of relationships, being very collaborative, um, the, d the design is co-constructed. So I may have questions about that context as someone on the other side of the world, but I need to have conversations about the people who are living that context and to see how, how these two things can come together. So the, the design is, col is collaborative, co-constructed. The research questions, the data collection is collaborative. The interpretation is collaborative. Um, as, a, as an outsider, there are so many things in, in these contexts that I have no access to because I don't have the cultural understanding. So we need to, you know, sort of bring that, in, in doing this qualitative ethnographic research, bring together this, you know, kind of emic and etic perspective, um, and, and then let, let the interpretation uh, kind of grow from there. Um, I also wanted to say something that relates to what David was saying about, about the assumptions that we go in with. Lots of assumptions about how informed consent works. So informed consent we learn about through our, our um, Behavioral Research Ethics Board here at UBC. Um, I think that over the last decade um, of, of working with the Behavioral Research Board, they've learned a lot about, a lot more about international research. And so the idea of what signed consent means in certain communities. In some places where you sign your name on a piece of paper, a week later you have no land, you have no house, you're, you're moved out of there. So what does signed consent mean in this context? You have to ask that question. Um, I've worked with uh, vulnerable populations, child-headed households in Uganda. Having, having kids with no guardians, no parents, 12-year-olds who are running households, um, you, you have to find another way of getting consent. We, we've recorded consent in, in that instance. And so it's really asking those kinds of questions. The, the women's literacy program that I worked with in the northern part of Uganda, women, they need their husband's consent to participate in the research project. Um, this, I'll tell a quick story. Um, the, the women who initially, I, I worked in this area for about three years, and when the women first gave signed consent, uh, or sorry, when their husbands first gave co signed consent, they, they kind of moved through the, the, the literacy program and the research. Part of that, it was very free Aryan based, and part of that was developing um, co-ops and businesses. And some of the women developed these very, very successful cotton growing businesses to the extent that their husbands became financially dependent on them. And their thinking started to shift during, during that period. And so when we started a new project and we wanted the women to participate and new signed consent, some of the husbands were saying, I'm not so sure about this. I don't, I don't really think this is going to be a good idea for them to continue to do this research. Their thinking's changing. Something's happening here. Um, and one woman in this community setting stood up and she said, if I have to choose between the literacy program and the research or being married to you, I choose the literacy program and the research. And this sent shock waves through the community and we had to kind of regroup and kind of re, you know, piece things together um, and, re and rebuild trust. And so it, it's also asking questions about um, you know, where, where is the decision-making power? And as much as that challenges me as a woman, 
I don't have a choice about that. That's, that's the way we, we proceed. Um, the last thing I wanted to say relates to a point that David made about some of the assumptions that we make with our methods, um, how, how you proceed with, uh, with interviews. And I just think, I think that we, we often have this bias um, that, that language is the best way to get the information that we want. And I've learned um, over, over the years that, that sometimes having, having participants do something that is performative or that is a visual representation of an experience, they can allude to things through those alter alternative modes that can't be spoken in that context. Issues around sexuality, certain kinds of um, difficult experiences that are much more easily expressed through, through modes other than language. So it's just um, to think through, you know, what are, what are valued modes of communication in this context and how can those be built into, into the research design? Language can sometimes set up a, a barrier, um, so, so it may not always be the best, the best approach. So. Thank you, Marie. And which language? And which language as well, right? So what, what kind of a hierarchy gets set up with English and when you feel like you're speaking English with a certain accent or certain, you know, so there are all of those kinds of um, issues that you, that you have to think through, social class and language and um, all of that. So. Okay. Thank you, Maureen, very much. I've been involved in international research from the time I was an undergraduate student and uh, many times I've encountered the issue of uh, insider, outsider, be it in Canada, very recently. Other jurisdictions, they see me as Canadian. But when I'm in Canada, I'm seen as outsider. So those are some of the things that is, I always confront that, but I've learned how to go about it. The other assumption, which I know many people hold it, when we talk of, say, Africa, and you encounter one good person from there, then you think all of them are good, or one bad, and then everybody is <laughs> bad. Now, Maureen has talked of Kenya, David has had experiences in Kenya, or East Africa, but within that same region, I happen to have been born in East Africa, but within Kenya, where I was born, there are 42 tribes. I have tried to get research collaborators from that region, and depending on where somebody comes from, the approach has been as foreign as it is to any one of you. I was born in Kenya, but it can be very foreign. Because of one, they have mentioned, the research culture. Certain individuals understand the research different. So it's like courting. You need to get the right party to work with. One who has same interest as you. Many times we say, oh, the interest in research is to learn. You might be in for a shock. <laughs> <laughs> when you come across a potential collaborator and you are being asked, what is, in, what is in for me? And you think, okay, could be publishing papers. But it's no. How much money <laughs> will I be getting from that? So one has to think of all those. You have to consider money different research culture and the different ways of connecting even with the people. That is very important. We've talked of consent. UBC, you've heard they say, okay, somebody has to sign consent before they participate in your research. You're a UBC researcher. 
your collaborator does not believe in that. <laughs> so you tell them this and they're asking you, what is this about? Initially, you will be surprised, but they have a reason. Kenya, where I was born, if you just show anybody, it doesn't matter, whether he's a minister, whether he's who, tell them, I would like you to participate in research. This is what the research is about. Can you sign here? <laughs> You'll see them changing. They'll tell you, may not have time, but I know somebody <laughs> who could work with you. Why? Historically, signing something was associated with the police. Anytime you were arrested, whatever, they read a statement for you, <laughs> and you were told, <laughs> what you are signing is that this is coming from you and is what we will use as evidence against you. Nobody will sign consent initially. So you start to learn, talk to them. Once they, they are in the mood and they are in the process and they are enjoying it, you bring anything, they will sign. <laughs> you now understand. And including collaborators. They would be collaborators, but they will be skeptical about signing. Because they are worried you might also want them to sign. And the signing, they would believe maybe one, there is money you got. That you, want, you want them to sign it away. And so on. So cultural differences can be overcome in condition that... Uh, you need to know who you are working with. And they have come to learn that before you engage even in research, sometimes just visits, giving presentations and interaction, looking at what people do, their publications. And what they call publications in one context might be different <laughs> from another context. UBC, you talk of papers in Farid journals and so on. You go to certain universities in East Africa. If you've never published a book, you are nothing. So everybody wants to publish a book. That's what they are looking for. So if you don't talk of a book, you see people moving. Back. The other one is uh, because of the research methodologies we talked over quantitative, qualitative, most research that I've come across around the world, initially people think of surveys and so on. But any time you talk of another form of research, then if you are not careful, you might be the one dominating. It will be you know, we don't know. So tell us. That is not a very healthy <laughs> collaboration because you want the two, that is both sides to participate equally. The most challenging situation that I came across is where my collaborator believed it is me who is going to do research and his role was to get me people to assist me. That, oh, that secretary will make sure there is an office for you. And they'll make sure there is tea. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to supervise students on practical. So you are in that country alone. There is an office. They'll arrange a driver who will be picking you, will be taking you, wherever. But they're not participating in the research. At the end of it, they want to be part of the publication. But when you have meetings to review the data, not meaningful. I consider that also very valuable. You come to understand people and the way they do things so that you can make very prudent choices. Otherwise, there are many people who have been frustrated, including me, where my first sharp ground I had was a friend. This was really a friend I thought would be a very productive person, 
But every time we traveled, David didn't know this, but David was part of that study. We would arrive in that country, and this guy would, would call from another city, very far, so he would never show up. <laughs> Until we came across another professor lady who was so good, and it was very productive, we decided, okay, we can forget about this guy and embrace this lady. And she became part of our research. Then we realized people are different. She has a research culture. She knows what is happening. So, but if we used to that guy would have, my friend David would have believed, these guys are useless. You never get anybody from that area to collaborate. So the benefits I've gained from international engagement is learning how people do things and trying to share my own and trying to negotiate a balance with them. Making it clear from the beginning as to what will be involved, I found that to be very important so that nobody is getting into the collaboration blindly. They know what is involved. They know what is expected. If it is papers to be published, if it is collection of data, and so on, they know their role. Otherwise, you might end up being leveled. That oh, you came and you went. Some of the charges, when you hear them, oh, they came, collected data, they went. I have my own views about that. Sometimes it's just a failure to, to let that person know what their role is. And then if they don't participate and you're wondering, if they didn't participate, how can I involve them? So there are challenges, but once you manage those challenges, you should be able to succeed. I'll give you a good example now in Canada of those challenges. I went through prep here to do research within one of the school districts in Vancouver or in BC. So I got the ethics approval from UBC and applied for approval from the school district. And they were very happy. But then they told me, oh, we have a list some of teachers you can let us just send the invitation <laughs> to the list staff. The teachers will choose whether they want to participate in your study or not. I can tell you there was no response. <laughs> <laughs> Time went on nothing. <laughs> so I had a graduate research assistant. She told me, you know what? <laughs> Let's change the tact. We don't have to rely on the school board. Let's go to schools. I went to schools during lunch time, time, talking to teachers. It is amazing how much people respond when you talk to them than through an electronic media. <laughs> we had enough people to participate in our study. So distance through electronic, you recruit, and they're going to lunch rooms where teachers are working, and you see they're ready to participate. Do they have time to read an email from the school district telling them if you have time to <laughs> decide on whether to participate or not? So those are some of the changes. Getting participants. You can get partners, but getting participants can be a challenge. But it's always good to learn a bit of these tricks or the culture of people. In other words, human relationship, human to human, still is the best way to make a connection. Thank you. So I've got three points um, to, to make. Um, and the first has to do with um, the distinction that I'd like to make between big R research and small r research. Um, because I think what we've been talking about, many of us have been talking about big R research, going out and doing research projects, um, projects and working with people collaboratively. And certainly I've been doing that for many years. Uh, I've worked a great deal in Africa, but I've also worked in uh, Pakistan and I've worked recently in Iran. Um, and, 
And uh, one of the ways in which I attempt to approach that kind of work is to identify people on the ground who themselves would be able, who are interested, not only interested in the research, but interested in developing their own communities so that when they have got their master's and their PhD, they can then train others so that you have that, that domino effect uh, and you have that more sustainable model for, uh, for research and development. So um, the one thing, one of the challenges, and I've worked with Maureen in Africa, is that um, uh, in terms of sustainability, is funding is always a major issue you know, in, in, in the African context. So you do need to have very good resources mm -hmm. because you can't assume that people will come with anything, in fact, on the whole, including money for visas and kids' schooling and so forth. But, um, so that, that's been, of course, a very, very productive and very interesting uh, research program for many years. But I think the small R research is possibly, um, in some respects, possibly even more important. And by that I mean the networks that we establish through our research. Because um, many people, as we travel internationally, need and want access. They want access to communities. They want access to publication. They want access to conferences. They want a access to um, uh, patterns uh, in, uh, of power, really, in, in certainly in, in different parts of the world. So, so my role as um, a book series editor, as a journal editor, um, has been key because what I've tried to do over the years is to identify people in the international community who would want, who look seeking publication opportunities and provide publication opportunities for people internationally. Because that is the biggest challenge for many, uh, many people in different parts of the world. Um, and also developing websites, I've been involved in developing research networks so that people can share what they're doing <coughs> and bring in people and make connections between wealthier parts of the world and less well-resourced parts of the world. And I think that's something, for example, at UBC that we can do because we, we can help to set up these kinds of relationships and through our publication and through our roles on journals and, and books, uh, book um, editorials, we can, we can actually reach out to these communities. Um, so uh, the second point has to do with the way the world has changed. And I started doing research you know, 20 years ago. And even in those, uh, 20, 25 years ago, and even in that time, the digital has changed the way in which I can do the kind of international research that I do. Well, 25 years ago, um, it was very difficult to kind of connect with people. You know, you would send stuff, you would wait, you would connect maybe by phone, expensive phone, you would write letters. But now that we've got the digital and we've got internet and we've got Skype, I mean, I, I remember, for example, with Julia Tembe, one of my students in Uganda, even 15 years ago, in fact, when she applied to UBC, which was probably around about 12 years ago, struggling in, in some little hotel with the only internet that worked, trying to kind of get that application in. And now I can have a, a two-hour conversation on Skype. So that is how the world has changed. So the digital provides ways in which we can work internationally that it seems to me that we, we weren't able to before. And I think that that's, um, I think that that's actually very exciting. And I think we... You know, but interesting what Samson was saying is that, of course, um, the human element, how, how, do you, how do you build on the human element? And, and what we, for example, do quite often with the digital is you, you kind of get onto Skype, you see each other, you say hi, and then you turn off the video. Because that's <laughs> one way that you can at least continue the conversation because you deal with bandwidth issues. But I think the human connection remains possibly the most important thing in, uh, in international research, building trust and showing that, um, that um, the research um, works for both parties, that, uh, that, that both parties are invested in it and, um, uh, and you can kind of work together collaboratively. Um, so my third point has to do with, um, in a sense, it's not, even, it's not even a big R or even a small R, but it's rather the future R. And this is the fact that by building these kinds of networks uh, that, for example, that I've been involved in and that many of us have been involved in, Many students at UBC have access, these are just undergraduate students, have access to um, uh, um, opportunities to travel, to work uh, internationally that they might otherwise not have had. So, for example, in Uganda, the Go Global, which is now actually called, has a different name, um, uh, International Service Learning, I think, um, has two or three sites in Uganda to actually go and, and get experience, work experience internationally, 
that they would not have had had we not had a research program in Uganda. So that's, that's pretty exciting. So what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is there are many offshoots to the kinds of international engagements that we have um, that I think are also very good for institutions. Um, and, and in fact, those students, in fact, one of the students who, um, who uh, Needy Joseph, who was on Go Global, has come back to UBC, is now being em employed in a summer internship, is now also thinking of doing graduate studies. So I think that there, there are these ways in which these connections then um, continue to, 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 to be enriched and to grow in, in multiple ways uh, that are not always that visible initially when you engage in the, in the research. So, um, so those are just three points. I, I did have, I, don't, I suppose I probably do have a little bit of time, just want to give you one little vignette, um, just to show you a little bit of the big R research and some of the complexities of that. Um, and I thought I would just share with you um, an email that I received from a collaborator in, um, in, in an African context. I'll keep it fairly um, anonymous. But just to show you that there are many unanticipated challenges. There are many wonderful things that happen internationally, but also some unanticipated challenges. I'll just, I'll just share with you this little uh, story that was sent to me on email. And the collaborator said, let me start by recounting a disturbing incident that took place last week. Since I came here, Mary helped me get a lady to deliver dinner and do my laundry. Last week, I got a phone call from a man who was upset that the lady, his wife, who delivers my food, also does my laundry. I told him she wouldn't do it anymore and if that was a problem. Then he called again after midnight and I got quite anxious. I told the lady not to come back for some time. The following day I was told that she had taken it badly and broken her husband's car window. The man continued calling several times a day, but I didn't pick up. I spoke with the principal and the principal advised that I went to the police and made a statement. The principal spoke with a man who called me, and I think that sort of settled things. At least he's not calling me anymore. I'm still cautious, but less shaken. So just to give, and I think we've spoken just a little bit about some of that complexity when you enter into a research site. Um, how does that disrupt in many ways? What is that happening on the ground? And the relationships um, that are already pre-existing that one has had no knowledge of. So how do you navigate those? and how do you deal respectfully with those kinds of challenges. So that's um, well, so three points and a vignette. Okay. <coughs> well, I mean, a beautiful set of stories and uh, experiences that we have on the panel, so I thank you very much.